It started about when I was four years old. My father was a music teacher and he was responsible for doing programs for a local Alliance Club, whatever, but then there was this big program like the, you know, District Music Teachers Conference in Southeast Kansas, I don't know. At any rate, he needed an act. I'm ready. So I was like four years old, and he, I don't even remember the song, but he prepared me, and I uh, was like uh, going to sing the song in front of all of these people. So I went on, and I mean, it was a full house. It was like crazy, you know, it's, and he played the piano for me. And I stepped out and I remember going, okay, well, yeah. And so I sang the song, and I will never forget the thunderous applause. And I went, this is, I didn't know it because I was only four, but it was like a drug. You know, it was sort of like, you know, hit me with some sugar, let's go. I mean, this is just great stuff. The next big moment I had was I was the second angel in the Christmas pageant. Stood on this chair, a white cardboard tempera painted cloud was before me. And then, you know, it was like we were waiting for the birth of the child. And I came center stage, headed for the footlights, and I sang Silent Night. And I thought, this is, no pun intended, heaven. So after that, I went, well, this is great stuff. So after that, I was in everything I could get into in terms of performing, I was there. And then I went to Emporia State University where I was in summer stock and I had the most wonderful time in the world. I had a, also traveled with a USO show through Emporia State University. Wonderful experience, just great. Made great friends, of course, and entertained the troops. Since then, I've done some regional theater, uh, worked in the Center for the Arts, which was an equity house at the time, and I did a lot there. And so I've just always done it, you know. It was, it's, it's been my calling. In college, I studied acting, and I studied the approach and the art and the craft of acting, because you can't create art unless you have the craft. You have to know the craft. In other words, Valerie Herring has to know how to hold the paintbrush before she can create a beautiful painting. She has to understand the pressure you put on the brush and all that kind of good thing. Not that I'm telling her her craft, but she has to know that. And that's the same thing with an actor. Because I always thought, you know, when I was in four years old singing for the Lions Club, I thought as you just walked on stage, had a lot of personality, a lot of energy, and make sure you could be heard on the back row, and that was it. And then I, you know, when I started act, studying acting as a craft, I went, oh, there's an approach to this. Ah, and one of the things I learned is that sometimes being you is enough on stage. It took me a while to figure that out. But all these people are inside you, but you have to be you first. And you know, the, my friends have told me that are neurotic and nuts, that uh, they don't want to, you know, go to a therapist or anything and get centered because it would ruin their artistic ability or whatever, baloney. Actors and actresses need to be the most centered, grounded people because that's by finding you, you find all of these other people inside you. I did get through college early, I went through in three years. And I got my first job teaching at Topeka High School. And one of my students was Janie Howdyshell, who's now Jane Howdyshell, who is at this moment on Broadway in The Music Man. She won the Tony three years ago for The Humans. I taught at Topeka and I realized I wanted to learn more. I realized that I didn't know enough to teach them. So I went back to school and got my master's, which was an interesting experience. And then immediately I was at that, I taught at the college level, which was at that time Sacred Heart College, which changed its name when I was there to Kansas Newman College, which now is Newman University. So I uh, left and moved to California and bummed around, you know, not bummed around, but I, I mean, pursued the idea of acting, which was really great fun. Then I came back and I was driving through town because I had all my furniture and storage here in El Dorado. And I stopped in at R.A. Wells clothing store and the phone rang. And Don Taburin, who is the head of the department here said, is Bob Peterson there? We hear he's back in town. And I said, Don, what? And he said, yeah, would you, because it was August, would you possibly maybe be interested in teaching a class for me, just a part-time class? And I said, yeah. And I heard the phone drop. 
And he said, really? I said, yeah. And he said, well, come on out and I'll give you the book. And so when I came out, by that time he had found four other classes and I was known, known as full-time, part-time. They don't have that anymore. I had no benefits, no insurance, nothing, but I had a full-time salary. And I said, sign me up. And that was 40 years ago. And then the next year he said, you know, I think we need to make this permanent. So he went to the board and said, we need to make this permanent. And so he has a full-time job, just full time part-time. So I said, yeah. And so I did that. And I said to him, I'll be here for two years. And I said, it's a two-year appointment and I, for me, and I'm, I'm, I'm out of here. And that two years has flown by. And here I am. It's interesting because they, they had a theater person here. The position was needed, but I didn't know how much I needed it. And I obviously needed it for 40 years. I had written shows. In fact, the first show I ever wrote, and it was just in simply, it was written during my two-year hiatus when I was in California. I wrote a play called First Boy, which was a son of a fictional president. It was a three-act play. Dakota Wesleyan University premiered it. Then I got the, the job at Butler and thought, oh, I want to do this show. And I did, and was very, very savvy because I cast as the first boy the president of the college's son. Carl Heinrich was the president, so I thought, this is going to be publicity. So, you know, it's all show business, not show art. Are you kidding? So I, uh, and he was very good, by the way. And then the next year I wrote a play called Saturday's Child. I wanted to see if I could write a really good role for women. And that's what that was about. And I wrote it, and it was about a fictional Miss America, who becomes Miss America and the relationship with her mother. So I was into this series of writing about people who got instant fame and what happened to their family dynamic after they instantly got fame. I started that kind of idea. That was the theme I kept writing about. But of course, the play that I'm most obsessed with and, and feel the most connection to is uh, Heaven Ajar, which of course is the story of the real president's son. John Coolidge and his brother Calvin. And for that, I, you know, it was so crazy. I, I just, you know, called the, the Vermont Historical Society and said, how do I get a hold of John Coolidge? Because he was in his 80s at the time, and I thought, there's a story here about he and his brother. And he agreed to see me. I drove out to Vermont with my dad. I interviewed him about events of his life that there was a certain event I wanted to know about. And uh, I told him what I was doing. And he was very, very gracious, very charming, very soft-spoken, very, uh, very New Englander. Came back, wrote the play, did the play here at Butler, and uh, then sent uh, the production shots to Mr. Coolidge and the foundation. And of course, those those shots are those production shots are now in the Coolidge Library. And he was very impressed. I was very impressed that he was impressed. He was. Uh, uh, he liked the, in fact, the, his secretary wrote me and said that he could not take his eyes off of the production shots, especially of the boy that was playing his brother, who was killed. And so that was, uh, so at any rate, uh, that became an obsession with me. Uh, presidential trivia is an obsession with me. It featured Scott McPhail now, of course, who is the legend that he is. He was 18 years old and he played Calvin Coolidge Jr. My mentor, Carl Bruder came down to see the show. I got from Doc Bruder the letter that I had been wanting to receive for him all my life about the show, because he was hard to impress. But I received a letter from him that is framed and on my wall at my, in my study at home, which whenever I'm down and out, not feeling like I'm doing, I read that letter. But at any rate, he said of Scott McPhail, he said, Bob, that's the one. He said they were all fine, but that's the one. Scott is enormously talented, went another direction in the industry than performing, but uh, enormously talented. I have done this show, I've reworked it three times. I did it again, uh, in fact, Scott encouraged me. Scott said, I think you need to do it again. And I did it eight years after the initial Scott McPhail production in 1988. And then I did it one more time, adjusting the title. I called it Angel's Charge because the original title is from a poem that Mrs. Coolidge wrote on the anniversary of her son's death. And in the poem, the line reads, Tonight, my son, you left the gates of heaven ajar. And so I called it Heaven Ajar, kind of playing with the words of Heaven Ajar. But then I changed the title to Psalm, Campus Crusade for Christ is not going to like this, 
I can't remember the Psalm. Psalm 90, let's go with Psalm 91. It reads, he shall give his angels charge over you to guide you in all your ways. Love that. And by the way, the uh, young man who played John Coolidge in Angel's Charge delivered the performance of John Coolidge. In fact, I've always said if I could just meld two performances, I'd take Scott McPhail's Calvin Coolidge and Kevin Norfleet's John Coolidge. There would be my show. To some degree, it is a craft, it is formula in terms of you have to have the exposition to the story, etc. In other words, the background so that anybody hearing the story will know what it's about. And of course, the important thing is conflict. If you haven't got the conflict or the dilemma or the problem, you haven't got a play, you haven't got a story. So basically what I do is just uh, think that process through and keep open to what's happening around me. See what good theater is. It's real life with the boring parts edited out which is why I always tell my intro to theater students, when they write your life story in a play, you'll edit out this class. I just find out something that interests me and then I just apply plot, thought, character, diction, song, spectacle to it. Children's Theater started with Daryl Patton back in the 1960s. And what he did was he did a show and would bring in kids, but he would also took it to Wichita to the Center for the Arts because he had a connection there that's no longer there. But Daryl Patton originally established this. I just was so blessed to pick up and fill in the template. I mean, it was there. It was his baby, it was his idea. May he rest in peace because it was very successful. So that was all in place. And what I came in is just new ideas in terms of shows, et cetera, you know. I did original scripts and his material was, you know, what Baker's Plays is doing for a children's theater this year. And he did really good work, really great work. But the template was there when I walked in. Alvin visited me and said, here's my story. Would you write it for me? And so Alvin, I was glad to do that for him. That's the story uh, I give to the public. That's a myth. It came from my obsession with the preppy look. And I thought, wouldn't it be interesting if he came alive? What if this came off? I mean, people are so obsessed with the crocodile it'll cost or the polo pony of, you know, Ralph Lauren. How about the Bob Peterson alligator? And that's where it came from. And I started writing this story of what if it came off his shirt and came to life. I wrote the initial play in one morning. It just was there. The COVID year, we didn't do a show. But then when I revived Alvin again, I wanted, I realized, oh, the first one could be better. And nobody had seen it. We had, it had been so many years that the kids didn't see the genesis of Alvin. I thought, I want to do that. So I talked to Bernie and Bernie said, yeah, I'll do this again. And I rewrote and tweaked and tweaked and rewrote. And I like it. Well, I've always liked it, but now I love it. It's called Truly Frank, and it's about being, you know, true to who you are. The message is just as important to adults because it appeals to the child in all of us, hopefully. I've always known that it was going to be for an audience of young people, and I wanted to teach them a value, not only to be entertained, but to teach. I had trouble admitting this for a long time because someone pointed out to me after I was doing this for a while, Bob, this is your mission. This is what you're supposed to be doing. And I thought, no, it's not. I'm a real artiste. <laughs> I will do, you know, a streetcar named Desire. I will do the great plays. I will do Eskews. I will do, you know, <laughs> you know how silly that I would do children's theater. And I realized, oh no, by doing the Alvin shows, I'm doing the important theater. I don't know how to define talent, but I know it when I see it. What you see and written on the page is going to adjust because of the marvelous energy that a good actor will bring to it. So yeah, you do make adjustments and sometimes you use what the actor brings you because a lot of times he will give you something that you didn't know was there. It's fun to watch talented actors bring it to life and put their stamp on it and their input. You know, because I don't want it to be a cookie cutter. 
I want, I, but they have to play within the, the fences that I've set up. Even during a performance, I'll say, oh gee, wouldn't it have been interesting if they would have skipped instead of jumped? You know, I, things like that. You know, I'll, I'll think, gee, that. And by the way, see, your audience tells you. Your audience lets you know what's working and not working, especially kids. They're honest. They aren't polite. They let you know if it ain't working. That's when you need to make those adjustments or whatever. Does it needs to be tighter? Does it need to be faster? Does it need to be, you know? I'm always thinking that. And usually by closing night, I'm ready to go into rehearsal. I've been so lucky. I've never thought this isn't going to work. Now, I've had moments in rehearsal where I said, get the smiles off your faces because you're irritating me, you know? I mean, because if there's always that rehearsal. No, I've been very lucky. I've never had a moment where I thought this isn't going to work. I've always known this is going to be a show. Now, how successful it's going to be with the kids, I don't know, but I've never had the panic of, oh my God, I'm in trouble. I've been very lucky. It's because I've just been surrounded by talented people. Of course, we've talked about the legend himself, Mr. McPhail, the Paramount Pictures guy. One of my students, Jane Howdeshell, is on Broadway now. Another student of mine is the artistic director of a regional theater company in California. A lot of kids have worked some regional television, soap opera, appeared on some TV shows, etc. A lot of them have gone on to become successful lawyers, doctors, ministers, good parents. Very proud of them. One of the most satisfying moments I ever had. He sat right there. Can't think of his name. He was from Blue Valley. And he was the quarterback of the football team. And it's the only class I ever had him in. Two years later, he wrote me a letter. And he said, my scores are so great to get into really any law school I want to get into. I can choose, but I have to have two letters of recommendation, just as a formality. Would you write a letter? And I wrote him back and I said, why? Because you know you went to KU and you had fancy schmancy fa fa classes, you had this business class and this law class and fa fa fa. <laughs> you know you had all that. Why would you want me to write you a letter when all I did was teach you about plot, thought, character, tradition, song, spectacle, and did shtick? And he said, because it changed my life. You know I wish I knew his name because I'm real proud of him. I was so impressed that a humanities class. An arts class was the most important class to this football player. I think that's one of my biggest accomplishments because I have no idea what I did in class except plot, thought, character, diction, song, spectacle, taught him the craft of theater. But there's this wonderful song in Goodbye Mr. Chips, which is the story of the guy who starts as a young school teacher and then he retires 3,000 years later. Early in this show, he has a song called Where Did My Childhood Go? Having been the senior member of the faculty, it is like when I drive on campus, I'm driving on for the first time. I do not feel my 59 years. I'm blessed. It has gone fast. And here's the lovely thing about it. I only remember the good things. Okay, there have been a couple of things in the last couple of years that I still, you know, still remember. But I choose only to remember the good things. And it has been the most satisfying, the most wonderful time, considering that I was only supposed to be here for two years. In The King and I, my favorite musical, because it's about two things that I like and support. It's about gender equality and about religious tolerance. But in it, in getting to know you, in the, the, the verse, Anna sings, if you become a teacher by your students, you'll be taught. And here has been my blessing. I have stood right here, teaching intro to theater and acting class. And these students out here, they're really teachers. They teach me. And they've disguised themselves as students and they have taught me so much. So that's what it means to me to be here for 40 years. I've gotten a pretty good education. I just feel like I have been through three hours of therapy.
this has been just really fabulous so far. I mean, all of a sudden I feel like a breakthrough and I can you know, go, you know, face my fears or something. This is just <laughs> great. This is just fabulous. Pri privately, that's what we were actually asked to do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you didn't get this in your culinary interview. <laughs> Haven't been rolling the entire time. Yeah, we just been. Yeah. We're done. Yeah. We're good. <laughs>